Disney's back to take you to a strange new world. This journey to a world beneath our own is so fast paced with so many wondrous sights to behold, you might have missed a thing or two. So yeah, here's what you might have missed in Disney's strange world. Hey, it's Patrice with Screen Rant, and obviously there's going to be some spoilers ahead. So if you haven't seen Strange World yet, please go see it. It's not doing too well in the box office. Strange World begins and ends with a presentation homaging pulp magazines of the early 20th century. For those who weren't alive to read them when they were new, aka this video's entire audience and myself, pulp magazines were an extremely popular form of low entertainment. Low in this context means they weren't thought of as high art. Basically, they were the junk food of media. They got their name from the crazily cheap wood pulp paper that they were originally printed on. Nowadays, if anything claims to be pulp inspired, it's generally going to be a self-contained horror, crime, war, sci-fi, fantasy, or western adventure. The one and only Jaeger Claude is a prime example of a pulp adventure hero. A big buff guy whose first response to danger is to rip off his shirt and punch that danger right in its face. Hey, sometimes it's okay to wear your influences on your sleeves, even if you're not wearing any, because you know, you tore your shirt off. I feel like it's illegal to tell a story about a family and not include a dog. I'm a cat person, but you know, dogs are everywhere. This isn't a judgment, just an observation. Legend's name is actually a reference to real life Disney legend, Bernie Madison. Madison's been working with Disney since 1953, working on the classics like Lady and the Tramp, all the way to the newer films like Ralph Breaks the Internet. Madison is the one who pushed for a dog to be in the movie, despite Splat already filling the role of the cute pet character. But eventually he was able to wear down co-director Don Hall and the three-legged member of the Claws was born. The dog even kept Mattins' nickname, Legend, which he got for becoming an official Disney legend in 2008. Let's be real though, all dogs are legends. And cats. A major plot point throughout the film is Panda, a renewable energy source that Searcher Claw discovers as a young child. Panda grows in a plant that's a cross between a pea pod and a cob of corn, with individual spheres that generate bioelectricity. Panda's energy production is so efficient that the Society of Avalonia made a technological leap of 50 years in half the time. If you pay close attention, the collection canisters employed on Searcher's farm bear a surprising resemblance to the screen canisters used to collect well, Screams and Monsters, Inc. Considering both films have energy sources that aren't as viable as they're initially believed to be, this may be more than just a strange coincidence. Did you guys notice that the painted flowers on the furniture in Claude's house look like the ones in Elsa's bedroom door in Frozen? The town of Avalonia did seem similar to Arendelle, at least before they discovered electricity. This may just be a coincidence born from reoccurring design trends across Disney movies, but it could also be fodder for the shared Disney universe theories. Although if you know how this movie ends, and we will talk about how this movie ends later on, I'm not sure how anybody's going to be able to connect this movie to the others in the Disney canon, but they can try I guess. So the ending of this movie might have taken more than a few people by surprise. To quickly sum up the film, it turns out that Avalonia and its surrounding mountain ranges exist on the back of a giant sea turtle that endlessly roams the seas of a lonely blue planet. The strange world that the characters delve into are actually its insides, with the menagerie of strange creatures inhabiting it acting as its cells and biological function. This is the movie's interpretation of a being known as the world turtle, a giant turtle that contains the world. This turtle appears in Hindu. Chinese, and several indigenous American mythologies. In some stories, the world turtle would actually support eight world elephants, who would themselves be supporting the world as we know it. Well, I'm sure that's a massive load, I'm, I'm sure they're fine, right? Splat's easily the most recognizable thing about this movie, to the point where some characters openly admit that they want to merchandise him. And given how much of a challenge it is to make a character with no face or voice so expressive and lovable, I can't really blame him. And when I said Splat doesn't have a voice, I meant that he doesn't have a voice actor. The voice for Splat was actually completely engineered by sound designer Shannon Mills, creating a performance that the other characters would interact with. This is like the equivalent of human actors having to act against CGI characters and backgrounds. And considering this movie had a Marvel actor in the cast, it was clear that they were up to the task. Disney is no stranger to teasing future projects in their movies. Pixar does it all the time, and we've done several videos about it. If you've seen Encanto, and who hasn't at this point, right? You might remember a strange spaceship appearing next to the Disney logo at the end of the credits. And now that you've seen Strange World, it's not so strange anymore. 
Remember the popes we were just talking about? One pope that served as the most overt inspiration for this movie was Strange Worlds, which was initially published by Avon Comics for 22 issues until it was introduced through Atlas Comics, which would become Marvel Comics in 1961. Atlas's run of Strange Worlds featured art from several artists that would go on to shape the world of comics as we know it today, featuring art from talents such as Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. If you don't know who those two are, they're the ones who effectively built the Marvel Universe as we know it, alongside Stan Lee. Jack gave us Captain America, the X-Men, Thor, Doctor Strange, Black Panther, the Fantastic Four, and Steve Ditko gave us Spider-Man, who for some basically is the Marvel Universe. I guess you could say this movie was inevitable. Speaking of Marvel, don't you guys find it funny that Jake Gyllenhaal has played two characters that develop technology that ran on glowing green energy? He played Mysterio in Spider-Man Far From Home, and I know his suit was all holograms and mirrors, but it feels like a sense of karmic justice that, unlike Quentin Beck, Searcher was properly credited for his work. And he even got to become this world's Tony Stark, an engineer seen as a hero by the people. Just like Tony Stark, he got to start a family, and he even has his own set of daddy issues. Good on him for not falling into alcoholism though. I mean, it is a kid's Disney movie, so that wouldn't happen, but he definitely managed to one-up Tony there. But can Searcher invent time travel? That's the real question. We've mentioned how impressive it was that Splat was so expressive despite not having a face. The animation team came up with a lot of creative ways for this little guy to move around and emote, with each of his six limbs doing most of the legwork. No pun intended. That's actually a challenge that the animators took upon themselves for every creature in the movie. They took inspiration from 1992's Aladdin, particularly in how lively the magic carpet felt despite having no recognizable facial features. And you can definitely feel their hard work paying off with each cryptid creating a chaotic chorus of charisma across the film. The tentacle monsters are vicious, splats shaped like a friend, and I kinda wanna eat one of those yellow globules that serve as healing salve. I bet they taste like pineapple. Although that's probably not a good idea. The message of this movie is to live at peace with your environment, and eating the stem cells of your planet probably isn't a good move. While the art department looked to the magic carpet for characterization, they looked to our own world for character design just as much. Some of the species in Strange World are based on various dinosaurs, but the blue sea star-like creatures that swing from the trees are based on a type of sea asteroidia called Linkia Lavigata. As far as starfish go, it's pretty simple, usually appearing in a few shades of blue and occasionally experiencing pink or yellow color morphs. I mention this species in particular because whenever the glowy starfish attach themselves to a tree, they light up like the foliage on Pandora. Now I can't determine if this was a deliberate reference to James Cameron's Avatar, but I do know that Disney is a big fan of brand synergy and plans on taking us to another strange world very soon. While many of the creatures in this movie are based on animals in our own world, all of them are based on microbiology in some way or another. As the strange world the characters travel to is actually the insides of a giant turtle, everything under the surface is in some way part of the turtle's immune system. The little nubby creatures that heal the surface are stem cells, and the first things to actually attack the cast are killer teas, which kill bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Everyone's favorite merchandisable cell, Splat, is a dendritic cell. Dendritic cells are special types of immune cells, typically found in skin, that essentially help induce immune systems in the body and produce antibodies. And considering how Splat helps lead Ethan around, you could definitely say he was doing his job. Hope you guys enjoyed that biology lesson, by the way. The writers behind Strange World put a lot of thought into making Ethan relatable to a modern teenage audience. Apart from struggling with his feelings for his crush in a way that felt natural, his love for his favorite card game, Primal Outpost, felt totally authentic. Especially that part where he tried and failed to get his dad and granddad to play it. And part of why it felt so authentic is because it's a real game. Well, it kind of is. And screenwright Hui Win wanted to make a card game that felt real, so they ended up writing out an entire rule book for it. It was also apparently designed to confuse old people. That being said, if they got a rule book ready along with what looks like a complete starter set of cards all drawn up, Release it as a full game. Come on Disney, it's no secret y'all love to merchandise everything under the sun. It's also no secret, like I said before, that this movie wears its influences on its sleeve. And I mean that literally. Searcher Cloud's outfit looks very similar to Link's tunic from The Legend of Zelda, with the green top, brown bottoms, and white undershirt. It's not hard to connect these dots, even if they weren't meant to be connected. While Searcher obviously doesn't seem like the type to naturally wield the Triforce of Courage, he definitely earns it by the end of his journey. Although I've gotta say, I don't really see Jake Gyllenhaal voicing Link. I don't really see anyone voicing Link. 
While we're on the topic of fashion sense though, does anyone else think that Jaeger looks a bit like Peter Griffin once he changes his clothes? White shirt, green pants, big belly, goofy dad? Ethan's journey begins by doing what a lot of people wish they could do, sneak out and take their parents' motorcycle for a joyride. When Ethan scoots off into the great unknown, he exclaims, I've gotta get me one of those. This might be a nod to Disney's modern classic Tangled, where the dashing Flynn rider had the exact same thing to say about Rapunzel's frying pan. If it's intentional, it clearly fits the spirit of the movie. Even the most simple of one-liners become iconic, and I could totally see Ethan being into Flynn. Actually, now that I think about it, a cast iron skillet is probably gonna be more useful in the wilderness than a motorcycle. The motorcycle is gonna eventually run out of fuel. You can't really use it to cook anything, and as Rapunzel repeatedly demonstrated, it makes for a very handy weapon. Now I mentioned earlier that Searcher isn't the most courageous type, and it's pretty funny that his name was given to him because his dad wanted him to be a brave explorer, which is obviously the point, as the whole movie is about him rejecting his father's legacy while forging his own to pass on to his family. And I can't really blame him for rejecting it. Who names their kid Searcher? That's borderline abuse. Although he did end up embracing it in his own way. He ended up searching for ways to utilize an alternative fuel source that ultimately did more for Avalonia than merely searching for the horizon like his father did. And in the end, he immediately volunteered himself for the journey to save the panda, which involved a lot of searching and even more bravery. It's funny how life does its thing, isn't it? At one point in the movie, a very special screen wipe is used to transition between scenes. You might have seen it in a little known indie film called uh, Star Wars, I think it was? This is known as the classic Star Wars wipe, where the screen will just wipe over the current scene with the next one. Considering that this movie is taking influence from the television serials that inspired Star Wars, it honestly fits like a glove. Although despite its name, that edit didn't originate in that magical 1977 film. George Lucas was inspired by the works of Akira Kurosawa, whose work ranged from samurai epics to contemporary dramas. It just goes to show that good editing can transcend genre. Also, did you guys notice that this movie can be abbreviated to SW, like Star Wars? Probably not, that's just, yeah, I thought it was cool. It seems like every year is an anniversary for something. 2022 celebrated the 50 year anniversary of the launch of the US space shuttle program, the Nintendo Wii is now old enough to drive, oh my goodness, and Disney has been around for a century. That's 100 years of owning all of our childhoods as of October 19th. Absolutely wild. To celebrate these 100 years of wonder, they've introduced a shiny new logo to put in front of the timeless Disney Castle animation that plays in front of their movies. And Strange World is actually the first Disney movie to feature the logo. Originally, it was going to be the third with Hocus Pocus 2 and Disenchanted intended to use the new logo, but those were changed at the last minute to feature the one Disney's been using since 2011. I guess this means that Strange World was meant to set the tone for the next century of Disney movies. Considering how how this movie did at the box office and how you feel about Disney, this is either great or terrible. Jake Gyllenhaal and Dennis Quaid have great chemistry as Searcher and Jaeger Claw. They really feel like a father and son, with their voices complimenting the animation department's efforts in that regard. It probably helps that this isn't their first father-son rodeo. Dennis and Jake played a father-son duo in the 2004 disaster movie The Day After Tomorrow. A major difference between the two movies is that The Day After Tomorrow is all about Quaid's character Jake Hall trying to rescue his son from an incoming superstorm, braving the elements and all of the dangers that arrive. Compared to Strange World, Jaeger Claude spends most of the time trying to get away from his son in pursuit of his own dream. It must have been a unique challenge for both of these characters to play their previous dynamic in reverse. Just goes to show how talented these actors are. Also, it was pretty funny that Jake Gyllenhaal didn't remember that the two acted together in that movie. You and Jake obviously played father and son in The Day After Tomorrow. Uh, uh, we years, did? Years back. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's pretty much impossible to talk about this movie without mentioning its biggest influence, Jules Verne's 1864 novel, Journey to the Center of the Earth, a classic tale in which a group of scientists journey to the center of the earth. The plot of the novel is pretty straightforward, having the lead scientists basically take the expedition on a dare. Much like in Strange World, the adventuring party comes across a myriad of locations that host all manners of life thought to be extinct. There are dinosaurs galore, and they even come across humans that are 12 feet tall. You can definitely see some of that story's DNA in Strange World. It's pretty clear giving the pterodactyls, and this isn't even the 
first time Disney's done this premise before. Anyone remember 2001's Atlantis, The Lost Empire? An absolute classic. Show that to you kids after this movie. Hey mom! Ethan? Oh, hey dad! <laughs> and you brought the dog? And much like any grand adventure, this video must come to an end. I think we learned a lot today, be it about family, literature, or microbiology. What did you guys think of the movie? Was there anything worth mentioning that we missed? Let us know in the comments below, and we'll see you guys next time.